My name is Joe Kirkus. I'm the chairman of the audit committee. And we'll go around the second. Uh, Lee Cheney, audit committee. Lincoln Saunders, chief administrative officer. Sheila White, director of finance. Sabrina Joyvon, deputy chief administrative officer. Brent Lewis, city auditor's office. Mia Castro, city auditor's office. Tony Noel, city auditor's office. Rochelle Carter, city auditor's office. Yolanda McCoy, city auditor's office. Moon Lasseter, city auditor's office. Dan Howell, citizen member of the audit committee. John Cole, citizen member of the audit committee. Can we go back to the end of the audit, please? Yeah. David Summers, Deputy Director, Diaz. Uh, Charles Todd, Director, Diaz. Jennifer Harville, City Auditor's Office. April Bingham, Deputy Director, I'm sorry, Director for DPU. <laughs> <laughs> and DPU Director. Jack Better, University of Communication. Jim Ellison, Director. Ellison, Tyler Lake, Reporter, Channel 6. Channel 6, and this is the camera reactor, Channel 6. Photojournalist. <laughs> 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 Chris Jenkins, CBS 6, photojournalist. And I think, uh, Chris, tonight, do we have you uh, online virtually? Do you, do you want us to introduce ourselves? Well, no, I just wanted to confirm, Kristen, that you were here with us. Or, I'm here. Good, good to have you here. Thank you. Hey, um, I'm here at Sam Bemis, citizen member of the audit committee. Oh, hi, Sam. I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were there. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, the, uh, the minutes were circulated uh, previously. Uh, I hope everyone has had a chance to take a look at them. Are there any uh, corrections or additions to the minutes? If not, the minutes stand approved. And I would like to... Uh, Welcome to our newest member of our audit committee, Council President Michael Jones. Mr. President, welcome to the audit committee. Okay, uh, external audit. Mr. Bussink, are you on the line? I'm here. Okay, the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. We're here to give you an update on the external audit. Um, so I'll touch base on the ACFR and then give you a status update on the single audit. So the ACFR um, was presented to Council on February the 6th, and we did issue an unmodified opinion, as I think I mentioned at the last meeting that we were planning to do. So that's been issued and uh, filed with the appropriate um, folks where the city sends those. So um, the ACFR, I think, is in good shape. So we are now in process of, well, I guess as part of the act for we do issue an internal control report. And uh, that report did include three findings um, this year. And so two of them are repeat findings that we've discussed in the past. One was on retainage and the other is the use of the miscellaneous vendor. And then we had two findings that, um, were resolved or cleared, I guess, from the prior year. One was we had a, a material weakness last year over the cash reconciliation process, um, and there was a prior period adjustment required. And then there was a finding over significant deficiency over internal controls related to policies and procedures of an access review. So those two have been cleared. So for this year, we have repeat retainage, miscellaneous vendor, and then we had a significant deficiency related to the bank reconciliation it was more related to the, the timing of the, the process. And uh, I think we saw some older items there, more of an advisory, but to, to make sure that that's being reviewed. Uh, so any questions on those findings? Yeah, I'm on I, I don't have a question very much, well, maybe this. Uh, did you issue what, is sometimes referred to as a required communications report that, and these significant findings would be a part of that, but was there a separate report? Um, well, it's actually reported the internal control report that um, was submitted along with the ACFR. So it's files, it's a separate document. It's about maybe a three or four page document. Okay, um, so I would find it online after that after the cap, uh, is that right? I have to defer to management whether or not they put it online. Oh, okay. 
but it, it does get unusual in that. I, I saw the record piece, and I, I was curious about other required communications. Okay, so what I was, was going to add to that is that it does get included as part of the single audit package. Um, so that that report will have a separate report on the single audit. And it'll also have the internal control communication required by government audit standards. So those the three findings I mentioned will be included in that document, um, along with the schedule of expenditures of federal rewards and then some required notes there. Yeah, typically we get a report on internal controls, but it comes with a single audit. Oh, okay. so that we have not seen before. Okay. Yeah, so that was something that I wanted to bring up. But nothing unusual uh, at this point, correct? Okay. So then single audit status, um, give you a little background. Uh, the city um, does, um, or I guess the single audit, I'll start, start off by saying the single audit is a risk-based process. So we do look at um, risk rating to different programs and it's based on a dollar threshold that's spent. Keep in mind that the single audit is based on mm -hmm expenditures of federal rewards, not grants of federal dollars. So it's based on how much money the actual the city actually spends of those federal dollars. Um, that's why you'll hear maybe the term called CIFA, Schedule of Expenditures of Federal Rewards. So that'll be the summary report that'll show by the, um, what used to be called CFDA numbers are now called ALN numbers, um, but it's, it's distinguishing numbers um, within the report that have a description of it. Um, the city does qualify or meet, um, I guess, fall under the category of a high risk oddity, and that's based on the material weakness um, that was provided last year. Um, so we're required to get 40% coverage in the single audit. So the programs that we're reviewing are TANF, that's technical or some sort of temporary assistance for needy families, adoption assistance, social secure, social services block grant. The coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds, uh, we call it SLURF, um, just to shorten a little bit, and then CDBG. So we've got five programs that we're testing. Um, the internal auditors help us with some of those programs, and so they complete some of the testing, a lot of the file testing that they do, because they're familiar with the, the files and the reviews that they do. So we're working with them to get their findings and results of testing um, to pull into our report. And uh, reports due March 31st, and we're probably um, probably 85% there. We're waiting on the last few pieces of information to finish some testing, and then um, we should be okay to make the 331 deadline. Um, how about to go back to the uh, schedule of fines and responses, Greg? I've got one comment and then a question. First of all, I was delighted to see that there were no uh, findings of deficiencies related to the internal controls of the Department of Information Technology. Mr. Todd, congratulations. That one's been on the list for a long time. I'm delighted to see that you got it cleared this year. That's great. Thank you. And then the second question relates to the uh, cash reconciliation. Uh, you've described this as not being a repeat finding, but last year, as we all remember, there was material weakness and an overstatement of over $12 million as a result of reconciliations not being completed. What is the difference between your finding this year and your finding last year, other than the dollars that may have been involved? Well, I think the the material, so the, the overall significance of the amount that was involved that does um, raise the threshold or raise the, the reporting of it. Um, so we found that majority of the reconciliations were done. Um, they could have been done a little more timely. And then um, that was really the driving factor was the difference in the fact that it was completed and appeared to be more thorough this year than in the past. And we didn't have the big exceptions that we had last year. Okay, but if there's it's still the same basic issue of bank reconciliations. Sure, maybe you can address that. I know so, there are some staff issues there, but we'd like to hear from you. Still struggling uh, with staffing. Staffing continues to be an issue. However, we have put in some more backstops in terms of making sure that everyone understands um, the time limits around their completion dates. 
So, so far through 23, um, as of today, we will have all of February done. So all of the, all of the reconciliations, not just the cash um, reconciliation, the concentration account, which has been the larger, bigger problem. Those have been completed um, and reviewed um, through January. Um, you just finished the first half of February, and that'll be reviewed by the 20th. So we put some more timelines in place to help the staff uh, understand timeliness, um, and we are retaining the staff that has been work, working on the reconciliation, so that's some good news. The people who were working on it in uh, 21 are still here, so we've been able to kind of, uh, they were new, uh, working on it. Now they've had 21, 22, and now they're working on 23. So that's kind of the good news, but we still need more people. Um, that's just kind of a fact of, you know, we're, we've, we've got a lot of, places where we need short staffing, but the people who are working on that, putting some more time down of like, to get it done by this day, other things are kind of waiting. Um, so it just means kind of prioritizing the work. So we're addressing it. Um, and I'm happy to report, we will be starting uh, to look at the disbursements, which we've automated. Uh, so Lou's, uh, Lou and his team will be coming in to look at that. So that's, that's helping too, we're using automation. I was, I was on our audit schedule yeah. for 2030. That's why Great. Okay, are there any further questions uh, of, of Greg Bussett? Okay, thank you, Greg. We appreciate it. Yep, you're welcome. Uh, next item on the agenda is the OPED update. That's Mr. Lasseter. So, OPEB stands for Other Post Employment Benefits, uh, not to be confused with any other acronyms. Uh, I did want to just briefly go over some results from that uh, and uh, the presentation on that that's before you. As you recall, in October of 2020, uh, we did an audit of pension and, and OPEB and basically found that the city uh, was behind peer localities in terms of addressing that liability. And as of, the, I guess, the summer of our FY22 CAFR, that liability had creeped up to about $118 million. So, 2021, right. And uh, so, to the administration, we recommended that they put together a cross functional team to address that liability, and they did. And uh, basically, there were changes in January 22 to the retiree health care system here at the city. I will tell you um, from a prior locality where I work, those changes were put in place a long time ago, as in at the state, they, they've done things. So uh, the changes that were done in a nutshell, change the system from a defined benefit plan for retirees to a defined contribution plan, which um, is a set stipend uh, that, that, that goes into place. So if a retiree retires uh, with 25 years of service, they have a $400 stipend or, or, or something towards their health care, correct? Or towards health care, right. And um, this is just OPEB. This isn't the pension system. So the new numbers were run uh, because there has to be, according to the GASB pronouncement, the GASB 75 report where the actuaries come in and study the, the data. They did that this fall, and those numbers are in the ACFR for FY22. The new numbers showed that the liability went down significantly to $22.5 million from $118. $96 million decrease in the long-term liabilities. This is a long-term liability shown on what you would tech theoretically call a balance sheet for, for the city. And the what is known as the ARC, or the annual required contributions to service that liability, went from above $14 million a year to 3.7 million a year. 
So if you look at that chart, you can see the historical funding of what the ARC was, what the city had been contributing is in that orange line, and the deficiency contribution on the gray line. So if the city funds what it was in 22 to 23, they will be more than addressing the, the actuarially determined contribution uh, for, for OPEP, for the ARC, to address the liability. Um, next slide. This is a, a drop in the liability. Like I said, 118 million, a little over uh, 20 million, and the impacts on the next slide. So, uh, are we have problems with the slides. Anyway, the impacts on the next slide again is a 96 million dollar reduction. Uh, this, the liability is now a manageable liability. I think the bond rating agencies will look favorably upon this when the, they see this change that they haven't already. And um, this provides funding to address other city priorities. So this, this is a pretty big deal. This is what I'd like to say. It's a pretty big deal. It is. Congratulations. How does the benefit compare? That the employee experiences compared to other localities? Well, that's a great question. Uh, if we did, if you go back and look at the report we did uh, a couple of years ago, it has the benchmarking from all the other localities. It's a very busy chart, but I think some of them are like the state is like three or four dollars per year of service, is it not? So if you retire with 30 years of service, X amount per year. But all the details of that are in the report that we issued two years ago. Of course, that data is two, but most of the localities we benchmarked with at that time, and Leanne worked with me on that audit, uh, had transitioned to more of a defined contribution plan as opposed to a defined benefit. The benefit comparable? Yes, sir. To Two employees. I want to challenge that because it was a significant change in what we what we offered. I mean, previously, if you retired before the age of 35 from the city, you could stay on the city's health care plan. Right. We are now providing them with a contribution, but right. not you know, kind of providing access to the city's health care plan. So it's a big shift, and we've had to do a lot of communication with the employees, particularly those um, who, you know, because particularly public safety, or they plan to retire before. Um, but the fact of the matter is for our employees, uh, the health care uh, available to them on the open exchanges is generally um, actually more affordable than what the city could provide to them, allowing them to stay on our health care plan because we are, you know, we pay all of our own claims, et cetera. And employees, because we cover such a great percentage of active employees' health care costs, it, it is affordable. But the exchanges provide much more. Um, Financially beneficial option for them, um, and at the same time, you know, as as the auditor has mentioned, uh, by by changing that in our policy, uh, we significantly reduce the capital liability for OPEP. I may not have been clear in my question. I was curious about comparability to other jurisdictions. The right. Benefit. I actually, and I think our defined contribution is greater than most other pure localities, so, but it is comparable in structure. So we're competitive as we're going to get into because that's part of the hiring issue. Yes. That's right. Right. Yeah, that's yeah, comp like <clears throat> and this is data to so that's old, great. That's a great all in the report from a couple years ago. They all want to look at Thank it. You. And to mark against several other localities in the state. The contributions continue after employees reach Medicare eligibility age. They they end up as that age to say that's too high. Medicare. Right. Medicare picks up at 65. Right. So. And the benefit now is for retirees that are 55 or older. So that, that so it's a maximum 10 year contribution. Right, as opposed to if somebody was capping it for 15 or that, that, that really bends the actuarial bar, I guess is one way to put it. It's really, that's great. I mean, both from the standpoint of the city and the employee, as far as our ability to retain them and recruit them, we're competitive on that. 
if, if you allow me just one more comment to that effect. I think when you consider what um, we are able to do with, you know, if our actuarial contribution was at 14, you know, would approach 15 million, the ability to put that into salary and benefits today for the employees has a much greater positive impact than carrying forward that liability. Yeah, so we pay for it. Great moves, great rewards, great. And much more flexibility. Yeah. Great, thank, thank you. you. Uh, okay, next, let's turn to the art reports and the uh, DIT chargebacks that's uh, first. Thank you. Uh, so the DIT chargebacks, constitutional uh, officer that was audited was part of the fiscal year 23 audit plan. Uh, first, thank the DIT, uh, Charles Todd, his team, uh, for their assistance with the audit. I'd also like to thank uh, Vivian Castro, Andy Ramos for their help on the audit auditor's office. So the objective of this audit was to evaluate uh, DIT's process for charging constitutional officers for services rendered. And the scope of this was all IT allocations for constitutional officers for 12 months into June 30, 2022, as well as the current, uh, current environment. So DIT provides IT services and support to departments throughout the city of Richmond, and this includes the constitutional officers. Uh, and those officers include uh, Commonwealth Attorney, Sheriff, City Treasurer, Clerk of the Circuit Court, and since we do not have a Commissioner of Revenue, uh, Director of Finance, that's in that place. And also, the costs for DIC services are primarily recovered from the general fund as well as through seven enterprise funds here in the city. And speed services include personal computing, frame services, mobile workforce, communications, file and data service, storage, and uh, mail services, just to name a few. As I noted, there were five of them. And certain city expenses for constitutional officers may be reimbursable from the state compensation board, uh, including some IT funds. So each year, the constitutional officers are required to submit a budget to the state compensation board. And these expenses could include internet access costs, telephone service, postage, and then printing services. And I do want to note that allowable uh, expenditures that are reimbursable figure between five different constitutional offices. And now I will turn it over to Jim. Thank you. Um, so, first, I'm going to start with what works well um, DIC expense allocation. Each year, the DIC director prepares the annual budget by estimating the cost of services that will be provided to the agency by DIC. Um, one possible individual line item for calculating down to the user. These costs are a cost for computers, software licenses, telecom services, those sorts of things. And then those costs are then allocated to the appropriate user for the user. Um, for items and services that are used by either multiple agencies or that cannot be tracked down to a particular user are prorated based on the number of full-time employees uh, from the 2017 budget book. And these are costs such as um, meter machines and mail stocks for the network. And those costs are prorated across all city agencies. So we reviewed 136 DIC service item allocations that all were deemed reasonable. Um, additionally, this allocation method was one of the acceptable methods that was provided um, by the city's IC consultancy. So next we're going to um, what needs improvement. Billing and reimbursement of DIT expenses for constitutional officers. Um, currently, DIT does not currently bill constitutional officers for IT services that we provide. Um, the city pays for these expenses from the general fund, even though some of them may be reimbursable. Also, typically, the constitutional officers are only requesting reimbursement for salary and benefit benefits and not office expenses and um, office equipment in their annual budget request for compensation for it. Um, the pie graph in the um, on this slide shows potentially reimbursable DIC expenses from fiscal year 22 for constitutional officers. We want to note that the costs on this chart for the, for the circuit court and finance include allocations for the entire department, not just the director of finance or the clerk of the court. Um, additionally, there could also be additional um, reimbursable costs that were paid directly from the constitutional officers' budgets. Um, we do want to note that the Sheriff's Department did advise that they can and do request vacancy savings um, from their budgets to be transferred to office expenses, which is allowable on the compensation board. 
Um, we also want to note that all items requested in their budget are not necessarily approved for reimbursement. Um, DIT is, um, finally, the, the second thing is DIT is basing their allocation that cannot be traced to the user of multiple agencies on fiscal year 2017 full time non employee numbers. We compared the 2017 and the 2022 full time employee accounts, and we noted that some agencies saw an increase in employees, others saw a decrease. Um, so some agencies are attributing more than their share, and others are attributing less. Um, additionally, there were four agencies that were included in. Fiscal year that are included in fiscal year 22 counts that were not included in 2017. So these counts should periodically be reviewed and updated. Um, in conclusion, we issued three recommendations with 100% concurrence. Um, because the fiscal year 24 budget cycle has already been completed, implementation dates are through February 2024 for the 2025 budget cycle. Um, this audit had 400 hours on the annual audit plan. And after planning, we budgeted 350 hours, and we finished under budget at 292 hours. Any questions? Thank you, Leanne. Thank you. Before we get to questions, Mr. Todd, you or anyone else in the city have any comments on this? Uh, no. Uh, thank you for your, your patience with me as we talked to you through the minutia <laughs> of the various ways these things are, are done. Uh, we're certainly in the administration. We've accepted the recommendations. We'll be looking for opportunities to implement. I do think it's important to note what she just said about that pie chart on that fifth slide, that that shows in total the expenses that we tracked to those agencies. Let's not assume that means necessarily those are the dollars that could be recovered, but those are the total pools that we can start with and hope that some set, some subset uh, the city could then recoup from the from the state so uh, that's what we're going to move forward with because again if you don't ask you don't get right so we'll need to in our recoveries um, need to be sure that we know how to track it the case you mentioned for the for the clerk's office if it's only for him and not for his staff or in the case of director white if it's for a subset of her functions we'll need to know that so i'll know how to track it but it uh, it sounds like just an expansion of a theme that we already have. Thank you. Any questions from any members of the committee? This was an audit that was requested by the administration to be put on the audit plan, at least to identify the costs for the internal service fund and see if they can be recovered, or at least it makes the case that shows. Yes. So, and again, the lead time is because the state budget has kind of, uh, in terms of the, the request from the constitutional officer, has already left the gate for FY24. So it, it'll take a little bit of time to unwind this, I guess. So. Okay. <clears throat> Next item up is Department of Public Utility uh, Billing and Collections of Brad Lee Thank you. Uh, this was another audit from our fiscal 23 audit plan. I'd like to thank uh, April and the team DPU for their assistance over the, the months with the audit. Um, it is a lot when you have an audit of this size, uh, working with the department. It's a lot of time, it takes a lot of coordination on the meeting, and we appreciate that. I'd also like to thank uh, Tony Noel and Chastity Toma from our office for working on the audit. So the objective of this audit was to evaluate the controls used for the billing and collections of revenues for DPU. And the scope included the billings and collections of residential and commercial gas, water, and waste water revenues, excluding the wholesale water contracts that we've done that in the prior audit for the 12 month period ending June 30th, 2022, as well as the current operating plan. DPU is a major utility provider in the Greater Richmond area area that services more than 177,000 residential and commercial customers. Um, it's composed of five separate utilities, your natural gas, water, wastewater, stormwater, and electric street lights that all operate on a self-sustaining basis. And for this, off, uh, for this audit, we actually focus on gas, water, and wastewater. And you'll note over on the right, these are the revenues that were generated in this one point two for the three different areas under audit. I'll actually turn it over now to Tony to recover the findings of the audit. 
<laughs> what works well? Utility rates. All the utility rates reviewed were updated in the system to accurately reflect those established. What needs improvement? Accounts receivable. As of June 2022, EPU accounts receivable was over 60 million. EPU has an overarching draft framework they are planning to use to address the increase in account receivables and restarting the disconnections. Age ERT slash outstanding service orders and estimates. In FY22, 28,044 service lines had a total of 131,106 estimates for water or gas. ERTs are devices that relay the meter readings to the EPU bands in order to enter them into the system. In the picture above, you can see the radio transmitter attached to the meter that enables the electronic readings. 9,798 service lines were estimated for at least six months. 3,807 were estimated for all 12 months. Of the FY22 estimates, 12,422, 9% were for zero CCS. The auditors noted the more estimated bills for a service line, the older the average age of ERTs were. Additionally, the rate of service orders on a customer's account increased as more estimates were applied, except for those with 12 months. Self-service option contract terms. DPU customers cannot view their detailed utility bills online. Additionally, new customers cannot sign up through DPU to receive e-bills and have to go to a third-party vendor to establish these services. Metro care payments. DPU offers water and heat assistant payments to city residents using the program called Metro Care. In FY22, water and heat payments totaled nearly 104,000 respectively. A comprehensive analysis of the FY22 Metro Care water payments was performed. $9,000 worth of discrepancy were noted, with EPU's tracking and team of the water payments. <coughs> Oversight of delinquent accounts. A process to monitor and oversee the collection agency work needs improvement. EPU outsourced collection, collection activities for bad debt accounts to a collection agency. A EPU staff member is their point of contact and works with the agency while trying to collect. DPU does not have a process to ensure to track or ensure accounts are returned after three years. Also, there is not a process in place to ensure accounts are correct or to track and monitor outstanding accounts still with the agency. Internal controls of adjustments. DPU staff creates accounts adjustments on accounts either by dollar amount or consumption as needed for a variety of reasons. In FY22, 14,709 service lines had at least one adjustment. Approximately 96% of the service lines were adjusted for less than $1,000 total. The system does not have built-in restriction on staff adjustment limits. There is no process to address conflicts of interest nor a formal review, pro review process for staff adjustments in place. Exceptions and completeness of order meters. The system automatically flags exceptions for DPU staff to review. Five exception types, high, low, negative, zero, and idle. Above is a picture of, water, of a water meter that could not be read as it was flooded, which may have generated an exception reading. There is no formal review process of work exceptions, nor a quality assurance process to track or verify completeness of water meters in place. SOPs and refresher trainings. Some policies and procedures do not reflect current work practices. Additionally, some available training documents were outdated or not present as processes have changed and the SOPs have not been updated. Employee development. Employee performance measures need improvement for revenue and recovery and billing and exception units. Managers within these units noted over 25 tasks worked by their staff for which they did not have a formal review process. Utility deposits. The auditors review both residential and commercial deposits for new customers and resettlement of meters to determine if a deposit was required. A formal review process needs improvement as some deposits were incorrectly calculated, not applied to the account, or support for the deposit decisions were not in the system. Additionally, EPU's customer service 
customer serve security deposit policy was last updated in 2005 and does not include current procedures for calculating commercial deposits. Five monthly benchmarking. EPU bills their water utility customers on a monthly basis. The auditors benchmark the frequency of water billing with 13 surrounding localities. Nine of the 13, 69% other localities of the localities surveyed bill their residential customers either bi monthly or quarterly. By billing monthly, staff have increased workloads as they have twice the number of readings and billings to review. If meter readings and meter exceptions are not gathered in review time, this leads to an increased amount of estimated bills. In conclusion, we issued 20 recommendations with 100% concurrent implementation dates through December 2025. <coughs> time spent this audit was on the FY23 audit plan budgeted for $800. Budget after planning was 1,435 hours. Actual hours was 1,390. It's not a lot of time. Yeah, a lot of time. I thought I said this is a big order. A lot of time. Ms. Bain, would you like to respond or provide any comments? Well, sure. I can just say thank you all for um, the great work and the partnership that you gave the Department of Public Facilities in this space. Um, this audit did not reveal anything that we really were not already aware of. Um, when I think about the breakdown of the audit, if I think about <clears throat> staffing challenges and just the overall um, um, need within the department. Um, if we could look at 40% of this being cured between accountability and oversight and QAQC, um, when we think about our staffing challenges, not only are we looking at frontline staff, but we've had a hit in our leadership um, pool as well. Um, we do not have a billing manager at this time. We do not have a revenue recovery manager at this time. Um, we do not have a deputy director for customer service at this time. And so um, I'm happy to say that we do have um, at least the deputy director's position will be filled on April the 10th. And so that person coming in will be uh, first in priority in trying to fill these critical roles for the positions and the um, concerns that we see in this audit. When I think about the estimated bills and um, some of the account concerns that we're seeing, Certainly, we're willing to not shy away from what is happening. We want to head them, uh, deal with them head on. Um, we are committed to making sure that any um, accounts that need to be adjusted, we will do so within one to three billing cycles. That is our commitment to our customers. Um, that is in the short term. Um, and as far as the um, disconnection process, we do wish to start the reconnection process in the spring of 2023. And when we think about that, uh, we decided to push affordability as the main focus around customers and their bills. And so we've been very pleased to bring forward two new programs that customers have gravitated to. One is um, under LIVOC, which is the Low Income Housing Water Assistance Program, which allows customers based on their eligibility and their income, they are eligible to receive up to $2,500 on their water bill. Any dollar that you spend, is a dollar that you can save in another, or any dollar that you save is a dollar you can use in another area. And so with that, we also have Promise Pay. And Promise Pay is something that we've worked closely. It's a digital software program that we've worked closely with our DIT department. And that's allowing customers to take into their own hands their financial concerns. Up to three years, they can pay off their um, aging debt with the Department of Public Utilities. The bonus about both of these new programs that we've introduced is if you are enrolled and you are compliant, there is no disconnection. Um, they, they, both programs were written, the Virginia Department of Social Services and the guidelines, it wrote that if you do have live lot monies, you cannot be disconnected. It is state funded money to help customers. And so DPU did the same thing. We wrote guidelines in our program that said if you're in compliant and you sign up, it will avoid you from any disconnection. So we're grateful to be able to offer that to our customers. Now, in the long term, we've got a road ahead of us. We have aging infrastructure, not just technology, but with people. And so we need to make sure that we're looking at succession planning, we're looking at the latest technology, we're looking at those processes that are that need to be changed in a post-COVID world. And that's just where we are today. Um, I believe that we have some dedicated 
and committed people inside of DPU, but we are challenged right now with a variety of things. And again, I say we're not shying away from what is actually happening. Um, we have a commitment that we wish to keep, and I know the team is dedicated to the task at hand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions? Any committee have questions or anybody else in the administration have any comments? Questions for members of the committee? Mr. Carter. Yes. Uh, looking at, uh, I, I appreciate uh, very much from, your, from this report and your comments, the challenges staff can achieve have to meet. <clears throat> looking at the, the portion of the report that deals with uncollectible or accounts receivable, um, the uh, a portion, there's of course a, a dramatic increase, but, and there's increases in every category, even those that pay in 30 days. <clears throat> to what extent is this a price issue or a consumption issue? Um, if you follow what I'm getting at, I presume that the uh, that the additional resources are intended to deal with the ability to pay, but then there's consumption, which is a bit different than price. Uh, I'm guessing that this jump, which is across the category from 2020, is gas prices primarily. But is that, how do I read this chart? It's on you know, page eight of 29 in the report. So, so let, me, um, let me try to address your question. I will say that um, DPU was one of the first jurisdictions, the city of Richmond was, one of the first jurisdictions to restore customers that were turned off prior to the pandemic. We wanted everyone to have services to fight the pandemic, gas and water. So we turned people back on. So that would be a volume of consumption issue there. That would be a volume that we need yes. to address. Additionally, um, once people were restored, we immediately created a universal payment plan we, we installed everyone into a payment plan, thinking that that would help versus having people to call and actually have to, you know, flood the phone lines and things like that. We took a proactive approach. And in doing that, we recognized that about 60% of those customers were not paying at all. We only had about 30 to 35% compliance. But think about where we are today. Three years later, we're still dealing with some of, somewhat of a pandemic. People are still teleworking at a higher rate than ever before. And so when you think about people being in their home, own homes versus being in the buildings that they used to visit every day, that could be contributing to the consumption. As well, when we looked at the $21 million that we got from CARES and ARPA to pass out in 21 and 22, and then the $25.8 million that we're right now giving out through Virginia DSS, those pots of money came with specific guidelines and rules that it didn't take care of all of the bills. So it came with timetables and guidelines that only took care of consumption for a period of time based on the pandemic. So if you think about people bringing bills and aging balances with them into the pandemic, that's what we're trying to help people with now. So if you started out, if the, the pandemic hit March the 8th, on February, if you had a balance of say $600, that $600 was not taken care of with any of the state money that we got, the $21 million or the $13.2 million, it didn't help. You carried that with you. And so it only took care of water and water, um, fix, I'm sorry, consumption-based fees, which is gas and water, things that you can control. How many showers you take, how many times you flush your toilet, things of that nature. So the bills continue. What's happening in my mind and what I see is that customers, the current charges are outpacing the balances that they have. So you may you may get a, a, um, a credit for the state for you know four hundred five hundred dollars, but your new charges, waste so water is the largest charge on the bill, not gas and not water. So you can control your consumption. You can look into conservation, but what you can't control are those fixed fees and some of the ones of the balances that have came forward. That's what I was committed to. Answer. A second question: uh, how, how do we account for uh, uncollectible? In other words, uh, you 
you make some assumption as to what can be collected and you're going to write off the portion that's not, I presume. Is that correct? And that happens on whose books and how do we pay for the write off? I mean, it, it just gets written off and so uh, I, does it, where's the children of the city also sort of where I'm getting at? I know not, it shows up in Yeah, I'm not going to part of a write off process being here in this world. Okay. Okay. Um, we we stopped collections for three years, and so we need to. I'm assuming I'll be working with finance or. So so there is a process. I, I'm, it isn't handled in the finance department. It is um, totally this team to handle. Okay. Um, the evaluation of the collectible accounts that's done primarily at year end. So you see that reflected in your 630 balance. Um, I can't speak to the specifics because sure. I'm not part of that review process of those accounts, but there is a process that is in place. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. and it's, it's only you, yeah. it's, it's uncollectible revenue. So it, yes. And do you adjust the accounts when you write it off? Is it adjusted all the way down to the consumer account? Or it it's adjusted at the consumer level, but I can't speak to specifics. I don't handle that process. I guess, uh, I mean, to me, it's a, a really delicate one because of the nature of the consumers that are impacted here and being uh, fair and realistic about what we can do and stepping up and, and getting us on a clean slate so everyone can move forward. Uh, I hate to see us fighting over this for years. If that makes any sense. <clears throat> um, sometimes you have to step up and move on to accept the reality that some things are not going to be collected. Because, I mean, that's, that's a big, big number, no doubt about it, but I don't expect to get $60 million back. And, and that was a question I had, so look, I'm sorry. Um, do, do we have a goal by, you know, what, what number are we expecting to collect on an annual report? I mean, sometimes, I mean, do we have some projection so I, my deputy director for finance is not here with me today um we have been um the goal that i have is to collect as much as we can right so i can tell you through the promise pay uh, payment plan in just less than 30 days we've had uh, approximately 1,000 customers to sign up because they are we're meeting them where they are mm -hmm. as low as ten dollars down to pay for that lagging balance, it's been it's been uh, it's been welcoming for them to see, and so um, we have to date about 1.7 is already committed, and um, we've collected about 62,000 of that thus far. If I could just chime in, I would just say that um, I think BP has been working hard to support our customers with compassion during this pandemic. That's consistent with um, in many areas where the city has been working to support individuals and not wanting to leave them without water or other utilities during um, a health crisis. Um, we have, I think, as uh, April mentioned, you know, distributed a significant amount of both ARPA funding and otherwise to help our customers you know, essentially uh, wipe out their balances or you know, to, to cover their balances as well as to. In this phase, now that both the federal and local emergencies will be coming to an end here this spring, um, it's appropriate that we're entering the phase now where we're giving people an opportunity to either enter a payment plan or take advantage of some of these other uh, assistance programs like LIWOP. Um, but we do need to get back into a consistent sort of um, expectation of, of payment and, and working with our, our customers because it does impact for ratepayers overall. So I think PPU has taken on a lot of additional work to help um, support uh, our customers and residents through um, through this pandemic in order to, to help support them uh, and not go to the, the step of disconnection that uh, would likely have resulted in council members and the city receiving calls from residents looking for that compassionate response that, that we were providing. Um, so we know we have 
uh, a plan in place to collect as much of that 60 million as possible. They will mention folks will have three years to to pay the, the balance. So I would say, you know, at a, at a high level, you know, the goal would be to collect that 60 million over three years by getting everyone into a payment plan, being being understanding that that may not actually um, we not may not be able to collect from everyone, but we need everyone to get into a payment plan. Right, and, and, and I understand that. That way, does make it look. I used the 60 million incorrectly. Uh, because uh, a portion of that 60 million is uh, 30 days and less. Yeah. That you're always going to have receivables. But, but I mean, I'd say so that the that attribute, you know, majority of the disorders to individuals being at home for during that three year period. Individuals who fall in that 23, 26% poverty rate and they just accumulated a bill that realistically, I mean, I, I can't even fathom having. A three-year car note, let alone right. a three-year water bill. So, so keep in mind, I'm not suggesting that we do anything but be compassionate and serving uh, this, no, this no, is no, citizens. It's just I'm now more interested in the write-off, the financial, and that's what I want to get to. What does the write-off look like, and how we go about doing that? Right. Because over three years, some may, some may not. But then, what do we do from, you know? From a debt standpoint, how do we begin to service that debt? How do we begin to plan to service that? And again, April, this being, they've done an excellent job. I mean, I was out in the cold, you know, February <laughs> 25th, yeah. trying to get people signed up. So we're out there doing the work. But on the other end, how do we begin to plan for the inevitable that we're not going to hit some of that, understandably so, right? And that would have been true in the past, too. Probably, we should have probably been writing off all of you know, for years and years, because some don't get paid, right? It's just up from, let's say, pre pandemic levels. This is the 90 day numbers at six, uh, six million, six point seven five million. And at 2022, it's 25. So that's almost a, roughly a $20 million increase so, right. in the, you know, the 90 day and longer. So we've always been writing off a bet. But we're going to probably have to write off a bigger chunk in the future, and that's just one of planning and and knowing it and stepping up and letting the public know ahead of time what's going to happen because this is a consequence of the pandemic and what we've been through. Well, uh, anyway, thank you for uh, entertaining the questions. Did you ask something? I was uh, curious that, uh, when you when you do the estimating of a Pretty, probably five percent of the accounts are estimated. Um, when you get to the end of the estimation process and you actually build them, is it usually your, they owe or you they've been overpaid? Do you know from the audit whether estimated is working or not working? Well, again, for es estimates can happen for a number of reasons, right? Um, going back to the pandemic, um, if a if a meter is inside of a person's home or building or property. We weren't entering homes during the pandemic period. So I'm just using that as one example. Um, say we had to estimate that particular uh, location because of access issues. Once we are able to reach that meter, uh, we'll set up an appointment to reach that meter, we will get a read off of that meter. But then at the same token, based upon the number of estimates on that meter, we need to probably just go ahead and replace the meter and test the meter. We have capabilities of testing the meter to ensure that they are operating and that they are totally accurate um, for building purposes. And so at the end of that um, uh, research, the customer could potentially have a credit on their account. Um, a failed meter test will also uh, require us to give the customer a credit based on our guidelines. So you may have some under build scenarios, you could have over build scenarios. And that's what we're committed to doing within the one to three months whatever, whichever ones that we're researching and resolving, that we will provide the, the correct billing within one of three months. And, and when you get to the end of that, to say somebody, what I hear as a, as a citizen in the community that people complain about is that they will get, all of a sudden they get a very large bill, all of a sudden it's, you know, they've been paying hundreds and now they're owed thousands of dollars when the bill comes and they contact to try to work out what how to handle it and how to get someone to become resolved. Is there a, a 
process or a person or a team that deals with that specifically that you, you can send people to to say, okay, you, we're going to get it straight in three months, but this is your person that you're going to talk to and get this resolved for you. And so we're standing those those individuals up now. Um, our, our right now in our call center we have close to 25 vacancies. Um, in our building department, we've got another significant half dozen key individuals. And so I think what we want to do, based upon this audit, um, not only are we standing up those individuals, but we also are looking at the procedures, like I said, in a post-COVID world. So knowing that people are in their homes more than they are in their businesses, it's a, it's a perfect opportunity to kind of look at what we have. Um, we will be uh, presenting to the public through um, communication. A letter went out in the bills this particular month. It started yesterday. They'll run through the month of April so that every customer, every bill customer will get a copy of that bill. And so we will be looking at bill messages on who individuals can talk to about whether they um, have a concern about the E on their bill versus the A on their bill. Great. Could I, could I ask you a follow-up question? Okay. Yes, sir. And you asked me the issue as well. As I understand your responses to the audit, um, the, the condition of the meters and the ERTs, particularly those that have aged, is contributing to your need to estimate bills as opposed to the accurate meter rates. And you actually have a meter replacement program in effect or in, in plan? Yes, sir. We have a meter replacement project in. We're planning for one. We had to kick off meeting earlier this year. And do you have that? Do you have the funding in place for that? Or do you even have, have a budget? We have right now. So we're looking at the data that came out of this audit. It's going to be a phased approach. Um, we realized that this audit looked at about 31, 35, close to 4,000 that have been 12 months and greater. So that's going to be our primary focus. Um, I believe we do have the budget. I have not heard any. Um, um, concerns about the budget for about 4,000 meters that we need to address. But long term, we want to look at those that are <clears throat> aging based upon years of service and install date. And that's where the meter replacement program is going to come into play to help us understand both the meter and the earth itself. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Sam and Christian, you, you have not been sort of opening the door, do, you, do either of you have questions on this side that you'd like to put to, uh, to anyone? Um, yes, Mr. Chair, I have a, a couple questions, if if you'll let me. Please. Okay, thank you. Um, first, I wanted to thank the auditors and also Ms. Bingham, um, thank you for your response and I'm glad that you're gonna you agree to all the findings and that you're using this data moving forward. Your office um, I know is short staffed, but when we do refer specific issues to um, the council of, of uh, appointed liaison, we get a pretty rapid response and so they're they're really good at dealing with it. Um, but I know they also probably want to um, see what we can do to get those those issues down a little bit. Um, so a couple of questions, if if you all can give me a minute or two to get them out, or I can wait for an answer in between. But how many technicians do we actually have in the field that are doing the readings? Um, and Ms. Bingham, if you could let me know how many actual FTEs you have versus how many are filled? The question was how many technicians do we have in the field doing the readings? Correct. So typically yep. our, our, our billing, our meter reading process is, is, is by a van. So the van rides through the city and gathers its reads based on transmitted equipment in the okay. van. Um, that is a team of four and we have four dedicated to those vans. Okay. The other so, technicians would be technicians that would fix problems that would either come up with a water leak or a meter replacement or field work itself. They're, they're not in the van riding around. They're actually doing the service work. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. So how many of the so 20 people in the field in the five vans and how many are actual going out when there's some sort of issue? 
So the four the four van rides, four van technicians, they, those are staff. We have the 20 vac 20 field technicians. We currently um, have a vacancy rate of about, I want to say there's probably 12 to 13 technicians right now on staff. The others are vacant and we have another 15 that we're trying to recruit for. Okay, okay. We try to keep at least 35 to 40 technicians at all times, if that helps. Okay, okay, yeah, that's helpful. Um, I guess, do you have any sense how long it will take us to get um, people's bills straight? I mean, I know that there's some bills out there that are fine, that are correct, um, but some are, you know, broken equipment um, or equipment that they're going to have to go in and manually read, which is obviously taking more man hours, so on and so forth. Do you, I mean, do you feel like we can turn this around in six months? It's going to take several years, like more research. Just wondering if you have an idea of that. So we're committed to the one to three billing cycles for the corrections. Um, what I want to make sure that, you know, I, I say here today is that the field piece is just one piece. So if we have a technician that goes out and performs the actual work, that work then needs to come to the billing department to be looked at, reviewed at, and put together by someone so that the bill can be produced. So there's a handoff that has to occur. So we're going to make sure that we use a very strategic approach in how we address this work. I want to look at the ones that are 12 months and greater to get us started because that base right now is about 3,800. And so if we are able to change up 3,800, we also need to make sure we can get 3,800 bills out the door in a corrected fashion. We have reached out to some of our contracting companies. Um, they are willing to give us resources um, to date. They've committed, one has committed up to eight bodies for us. So that's a good thing. So um, the partnerships that we have around the city are gonna continue to help us as well. I am hopeful that um, the staff is well aware of this audit. The staff is well aware of some of the media attention that we've gotten thus far. And so they're committed and that's a good thing. And, th and that's half of the battle right there. Um, and so I am hopeful that we will see a turnaround and a change um, within this fiscal year. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so as, as residents are contacting us and um, finding problems, do we just continue to, to follow the same process and send it to the liaison that you have on staff? Or do you want us to do something different? So we're, we're talking about what additional resources we need to amplify and communicate forward. Um, we just completed two community events, one on February the 25th in the, uh, District 9. We were at Southside Community Plaza and we were just out on Saturday, March 11th in District 7 at EDI, Eastern District Initiative. Those events not only allowed customers to come and see us face to face to sign up for LiveWap and Promise Pay, but we were able, we had tables set up where we were showing a display of a water meter and showing people how to conserve, showing them the different valves on the water meter and actually helping people at that point in time. If we needed to go and visit a house, we had technicians there to help us deal with that. So I think we're gonna to continue to have community events because if we continue to have people call the phone line and if they're not getting through, that's not what we want. <clears throat> so we wanna meet people where they are. So I say stay tuned for additional community events that are going to be um, put together. I would say um, we are looking at either a mailbox set up, setting up an additional mailbox or putting additional resources around the response time for those that need um, to, to, be, to be heard from. I am always available. I get a lot of customers now that will reach out to me as the director. And, and I, I love to hear from customers because it allows me to spend the time helping to educate on the situation. And a lot of times when you're in a fast paced environment and you're trying to get bills out, you're trying to uh, clear exceptions, you don't always get the luxury of spending that extra two or three minutes with the customer, giving them inside information about what is really happening with that account. So I think, you know, again, I say, to have dedicated staff that is ready and willing to help us pull through this, I think we're well on our way. Okay. That's that's great. And just one more question. Um, 
So with the budget that we just received, there's um, a proposed increase in rates. And so <clears throat> we're already starting to get some questions from constituents if the um, debt that you all have on your books is related to that increase in, in rates. The, the increase on the proposed rates for 24 would be $8.70 per month per um, customer. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our uh, budget is around people, power, and chemicals. Um, we are responsible for providing clean drinking water to the citizens here in the, in the city and, and providing gas services to the citizens in the city as well as in Rico and Chesterfield County. That rate increase is really to address maintenance. It is to address the, the operational needs of the business. It is not to really focus on um, the estimated reads or the issues around that. Yes, we will have some dollars set aside for, you know, a large meter replacement program that's coming down the pipe or the CIS system that we need to upgrade. But our rates are, are in, in alignment with what they have been for the previous years because of maintenance, people, pipes, and pumps. Jump, chime in on that, um, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Uh, I think, as April mentioned, one of the major drivers for um, any city department's budget, maybe most city department's budget, is personnel. Um, as we've talked about staffing issues, et cetera, staying being competitive when it comes to what we can offer our employees, be they public works, public utilities, finance, or any other department of the city, uh, is one of the reasons that the mayor included in his proposed budget an 8%. Uh, general wage increase that applies to our utility departments as well uh, and it's reflected in the rate changes to cover that we know we have to be competitive in compensation as well as you know work environment etc um, to fill these critically vacant positions and um, given that we have seen uh, inflation of around 13 percent over the last two years last year we were able to provide a five percent uh, wage increase this year at eight percent we're doing our best to help our employees keep up with higher costs, uh, as well as to maintain competitiveness in the market. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move to the next uh, order if we could. This continues talking. Brett. So the continuous audit was a scheduled audit on the, the two year 23 audit plan as well. Um, I'd like to thank the city administration as a whole. Um, Sabrina's basically pulled through EPP as well as other DCAOs uh, because continuous audit is not just a department uh, audit, it's, it's basically citywide. So we reach into a lot of different areas. Uh, it requires a lot of assistance across the city. I'd also like to thank uh, our team. Uh, Jen Harvell, uh, Chastity Comer, Summer Thomas, Lee Castro, and Rochelle Carter for their work on the audit. So the objective of the continuous audit is basically to compile and produce a semi-annual or annual report and test for exceptions. And the scope, the scope for this is a little different. We have two different scopes. Uh, some of our analytic are data analytics scripts are built around the county year basis and others are built around the fiscal year basis. And continuous auditing as defined by the Institute of Internal Auditors is a combination of technology enabled ongoing risk and control assessments. Continuous auditing is designed basically to enable the internal auditors to report on subject matter within a much shorter time frame than under the traditional retrospective approach. Now I'll turn it over to Jen to get a little bit more well and the Okay, what works well? Um, <clears throat> we looked at uh, system access and the separation so that access to the city system after an employee leaves um, employment with the city, and that was for calendar year 22. Um, we compared the separated employee listing to the active directory listing. To determine if uh, separated employees still have access after separation. Um, we noted that two employees were found to have active directory access when we pulled our reports. However, when I actually did the testing in January, that access had been removed. 
And if you look at the chart, uh, 2020, 2021, and 22, that's a big improvement um, over the last couple of years. Uh, one of the changes I just want to highlight for DIT is as of um, July 1st, 2022, uh, they began removing employee access upon receiving the separation report from HR rather than waiting on the department automation coordinator to send the request directly to DIT. So that's, that's made a big difference. Uh, the next thing that works well is the top 40 paid vendors. That is gone on fiscal year, so fiscal year 22. Um, we looked at the top 40 paid vendors. They had a total distribution amount during that time period of 1.6 billion. 20 of the top 40 had contracts with the city, while the remaining vendors had payments, but they were for non-departmental, debt service, health care, payments to RPS or on the cap of RPS. Based on the review of the top paid invoices for the 20 that had active contracts with the city, um, the payments, that was determined, the payments were reasonable based on the invoice description and the contract review. Next, we looked at um, employee vendor matching and that was done on fiscal year 22. Um, a total of 44,620 vendor payments were reviewed and matched against employee data information to identify potential conflicts of interest. There were 29 matches found. However, however based on the review of all of those invoices paid to these employees, we found no conflicts of interest, none were identified. Payments to those employees were expense reimbursements, travel advancements, education, certification, things like that. Next one. What needs improvement? Uh, miscellaneous vendor, fiscal year 22. Uh, the city has miscellaneous vendor attributes, which we kind of touched on earlier. Um, but it does allow the user to bypass the city's procurement process. Uh, the main purpose of the supplier code was to issue payments for postal services, jury duty, uh, voter registration and refunds. Use of the okay. use of the miscellaneous vendor attribute was noted as a significant deficiency in the external auditor's report um, for the last six years. Here in fiscal year 22, um, the attribute was used 9,467 times for a total of $10.9 million, which is a decrease from 21. Uh, we reviewed the support documents of one payment for each vendor with greater than 15 checks or greater than $25,000 in checks, which we looked at 41 payments and noted no exceptions. The payments were for were to citizens who were utility refund, settlement, tax sale of property, things like that. Uh, the review will remain a part of the annual continuous review of the compensating control to mitigate risk. Duplicate payments for fiscal year 22, we analyzed um, city invoices greater than $300 in that. We looked at vendor name, invoice date, invoice amount um, to identify potential duplicate payments. Uh, we looked at a total of 1,367 invoices, which totaled $11.7 million. 19 invoices were identified as duplicate payments for a total of $34,343, $323, excuse me. Um, 17 duplicates um, from six departments still need to be recovered. Two duplicates totaling 1,270 have been recovered. Next slide. Um, FMLA hours, that's done. So our hours are allocated on calendar year. So this would be calendar year 22. Um, we noted that seven employees exceeded the annual FMLA hour allotment threshold. Three were paid parental sick leave, 86.25 hours, which totaled uh, $1,854. And four were paid maternity bonding leave for 108.5 hours, for a total of $3,852. Holiday leave hours, uh, 25 employees used more holiday leave hours than they were allotted. 
13 of the employees required an adjustment, 230.5 hours and $5,679. And these were made prior to the audit. Uh, four employees did not require an adjustment because the holiday credit was used or there was a key error when they entered the employee's time. And eight employees, we could not conclude on the lead adjustments whether they were, whether the adjustments needed to be made or not. That information has been provided to the department timekeepers and they are looking into that. Um, all of this information has been provided to the political department so they can uh, further review. Loading holiday also on the calendar year um, for 22, we found 55 employees that exceeded the limit for the loading holiday hours. Um, 36 required adjustments to their lead balance. The total dollar figure was 7,336. 11 were corrected prior to the audit. Three did not require adjustments because their employees had already left the city. And five, the auditors did not conclude on. Um, two were noted by the department as done. However, we were still meeting to support documentation. Um, in reviewing employees hired after May 1st, one employee used holiday loading hours. It was 11.5 hours that did not earn it for $304. 38 employee adjustments were identified due to the audit. Again, all of these hours have been communicated to their respective department so that they can do um, corrections and further research as needed. Uh, paid beyond separation. This was done on uh, calendar year 22. Uh, we noted that 24 employees paid were paid more than 14 days after their separation date in rapids. Um, it was found that one employee was overpaid $1,692 and as of February 2023 it had not been recovered. The three-year trend data on this shows that the number of employees paid regular earnings more than 14 days after separation has decreased. For vacation and holiday payouts more than 30 days, uh, there were 31 employees paid um, vacation and holiday payouts more than 30 days after separation. One employee received an overpayment for $582, which has not been recovered yet. Um, and there's not a real big change as you can see by that graph in these over the last three years. Overtime, um, we also looked at calendar year 22. Uh, 67 employees in seven departments earned overtime in excess of 1,040 hours. 37 of those 67 employees um, earned 1,040 hours, 1,040 overtime hours in calendar year 21 as well. Um, fire and emergency <coughs> services had the majority of the employees, so 43. Overtime in excess of 1,040 hours has increased each year from calendar year 2020, 2021, 2022. Um, we request and review support documentation for the highest overtime period for the top 20 overtime earners. All but one employee had supporting documentation and were approved. The one exception was paid 12 hours of overtime that we did not have supporting documentation for. Um, additionally, City Council's Government Operations Planning Committee as of February 2023 has not been sent the monthly overtime reports as requested by the City Council resolution. Next slide. <clears throat> so in conclusion, we issued three recommendations with 100% concurrence with implementation dates through September 30th, 2023. Uh, the audit plan had 700 hours on the fiscal year audit plan. Uh, budgeted hours after planning was 670 and actual was 660 hours. Any questions? I know that last year you had mentioned revenues, and we do have several 
audits going on right now that are dedicated to revenues, specifically meals, taxes, parks and rec, personal property on the plan as well. So I just wanted to, to let you know we're, we're trying to pay attention to the to various and sundry requests. Uh, I know last time we presented this, uh, you had mentioned that. Does anyone from the state administration wish to come in? Uh, Kristen, I see your hand up there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the overtime issue because when we got this report, um, I think it was the last time city council did legislate a limit on overtime and that is not being followed. So really concerned about that, especially with fire, the, um, the overtimes continuing to, to increase over there. Um, and we discussed at the time that we put forward the, the legislation that we're talking about health and safety issues, as well as a liability for the city. So just really concerned about those numbers. If I can respond, I'll just say, um, I think we've all been uh, concerned and focused on how we can reduce the uh, overtime hours and particularly in the area of fire. Um, due to mandatory staffing levels and otherwise fire that have to implement mandatory overtime um, uh, within the last year plus. Um, they are with the graduation of, of the latest recruit class, I wanna say uh, five or six personnel below their authorized FTE count. So that should enable them to, to staff um, appropriately without requiring necessary overtime. We also did receive the SAFER grant, which is gonna allow us to restore uh, three companies to the fire department. Uh, that class is in is in recruitment now. They're doing interviews. Um, so you know, we have been trying to manage this by uh, intentionality around recruitment and staffing, um, while also uh, maintaining our service levels and staffing levels um, in this period of, of recruitment, um, because we have to keep our community safe. And so I, I certainly. Um, appreciate the council members' concern, and we are all concerned with with overworking. We're having to devote too many overtime hours, particularly um, for any department of public safety. Uh, unfortunately, we do need we did need to get staffed in order to, to be able to turn that tide. I think where we are today, um, you know, I, I do know that things like military leave and uh, light duty and others, whether you have even we may have, you know higher up to our full FTE count, but it's still may require overtime when we have other types of leave come into play um, for, uh, but again, getting closer to that fully staff level and particularly with the uh, safer grant and being able to restore three companies. Uh, I hope that we can um, show some significant uh, improvement over the next year in uh, the need for overtime, uh, particularly in fire. It's important to note too that the standard firefighter schedule based on FLSA does require 168 hours uh, um, over the year. Um, it's just the way that it falls with the one on, the 24 on, and two days off. A that's little bit built into the system. That goes kind of that's right. that's built into Perfect. their scheduling, yes, sir. And and that's pretty well common, at least in terms of how fire departments handle the staffing. It's one on, two off. They have an A, B, and C shift. Yeah. <clears throat> well, any further questions or comments on the report? Great. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Lou, you have a report on the Richmond Ambulance Authority. Just quickly here with Sabrina and Lincoln. This was a listed non audit service on the audit plan. Uh, the administration contracted and, and 
we gave some info to bring up on the, the, re the request, the quote uh, document that went out. The review was done and presented to city council on March 6th, I believe. It has uh, seven broad initiative areas with about 18 recommendations. And uh, we have put this report on our webpage as a non-audit service for the, the public. It's been distributed. I don't know if, if uh, Lincoln or Sabrina have anything else they'd like to mention briefly about the RAA review. Um, I'll just say we really appreciate the collaboration from the auditor's office as well as the work of uh, the Robert Bob group and the center that completed this review. Um, uh, it, it speaks to a number of the issues that we were concerned about um, around this time last year uh, regarding uh, inventory services, billing, and, and rates. Um, we have internally um, designated a point person for um, supporting RDA implementation. I believe RDA is still working through who they're going to put on first um, with the implementation from their side. Some of the recommendations like um, a monthly meeting amongst our public safety leads that would include police, fire, emergency management, emergency communications. Uh, REA uh, have already begun and are helping with coordination and um, broader uh, collaboration across the, the public safety leads. Um, but there, there are some significant findings in here that uh, I think we are, we are hoping to see REA move quickly on implementing, working with their board, um, of which Ms. White is not going to serve on. Um, we want to make sure we're maximizing payments from private insurers, Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, there has been a uh, plan kind of on the shelf for many years regarding consolidating the call centers between REA and um, DEC. Uh, it is, I think, something that certainly um, can be concerning for a caller to, to call them 911 and then be transferred and essentially you know, have that delays in the process for, for dispatch uh, of inventory services. And so I think we're excited about the opportunities to strengthen our partnership and collaboration with RAA to better serve our residents. For the members of the RAA board, um, are they appointed by localities, by the city? It only serves the city. It only serves the city, okay. So I want to say that some are, are uh, designated by the Charters they could uh, that formed the ambulance authority, um, but many other appointments that were made by city council. So. And there is a council person that sits on the RA as well. I think it used to be Ms. Nye, but now I sort of couldn't do it. And is there any coordination with other localities, Chesterfield and like that have That RA's um, mission is. is within the, the confines of the city of district. And so while I do think, just like we had <coughs> made agreements with um, Chesterfield's fire department or Enrico's fire department, I would assume that REA has similar agreements with Chesterfield and Enrico. Um, Mr. Cohen does not say that it is the case, but um, so there's coordination, but as far as governance and oversight, there's no problem. Okay, any questions? Does anyone have on this? Okay, that brings us next on the agenda is the Inspector General's report. Mr. Senator. Yeah, so we have uh, currently 20 open cases. Uh, get ready to close a handful. We're still waiting on some interdepartmental, interagency uh, cooperation to finish up a couple uh, here sooner than later. Uh, we have two places that we closed, uh, both unsubstantiated. Uh, one had to do with uh, real estate delinquent tax sales. Uh, we view that that was not an accurate allegation being made, but we did coordinate with the agency and with uh, the attorneys and let the complaint know that everything was acting within uh, state laws and staff in uh, city code. Uh, so there's no issue with those at all. And then uh, working with, uh, and, and it's an ongoing issue that HR is doing everything correct and right with a employee who's a little disgruntled with his termination how that process is going, but HR is doing everything correct and no issues with that. So those are the two we gave, we, we just closed out. Um, we've got one that's referred to uh, a federal agency. Uh, we're expecting that to be closed out fairly soon. Uh, they have interviewed the subject. So 
suspect in that case. So we're just waiting to see what their results are going to be from that police coming out and then uh, what they plan to do with that. That'll go more into the district, uh, U.S. District Attorney's Office. Uh, and then we've got four cases, just new cases that we just added on. Uh, and that's, uh, any other questions? Okay. Good questions? Okay. Um, that turns to all business. The next item is the audit plan status. Briefly, you can see the graph for you. The green audits of work that has been completed. <clears throat> Yellow ones, we have the meals tax audit still in process, the adoption program, disaster recovery and DIT, uh, parks and rec revenues, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, cybersecurity, we have sent out an RFQ for quotes and received those back, and we'll be awarding that to uh, a vendor. We hope shortly to bring that area. That's always a high risk area that we try to schedule every year. So I mean, we pivoted to a new area this year from the one we did last year. I guess that's all I want to say in an open session. Uh, and we have four that we have not started yet that we hope to get started here in this last quarter of the year. Okay. So you want have questions on status? Yeah, I think our last item on the agenda now relates to the counter races. The audit that was done last year on this, and Mr. Summers, you're going to give us an update on where things stand on that. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, have John Fetterman here with our Department of Emergency Communications and Emergency Management. Um, he's going to assist me uh, if you have any questions, but you know, please to report that of the uh, five high priority recommendations, uh, one has been completed, and four are sub you know, substantially in. Um, process, including development of a RFP to support um, the department in the, the, the current future management of um, these tower leases. Uh, every other amongst the, the remaining recommendations, I want to say there's a total of uh, five that have been completed, and all other um, recommendations are in process and on target to meet their. There was some discussion at the meeting when this report was first made about the potential that the administration of tower leases really didn't belong with the Department of Emergency Communication. Uh, has there been any consideration given to moving that function into another department? I think it is something that we can continue to look at as we move forward. I think the, the, the place that I think has come up for discussion the real estate office, I didn't make that comment and suggestion. Um, we, I think, currently think that a RFP to support us in that management function is uh, the best way to go, considering that we uh, are also still rebuilding a real estate office. It's currently, you know, a, a, a small team, perhaps, um, of just one or so individuals. And so um, we think getting some you know, professional consulting help will yield a stronger result than just shifting it to the real estate I mean, is, is, is this RFP that you're describing, is that contemplate basically outsourcing the function to a, to a consultant? John, can you give us a little bit of an overview of what the RFP is concerned? RFP is uh, handling more professional consult consultation um, to aspects of leases, lease structure, um, and marketability. So ensuring that we know what, how many leases we can have on a tower because a lot of that is more of a professional or engineering service. Um, do, you, do you have an employee who's dedicated to this task? I am dedicated to this task. You are here. You've got an incredible responsibility and this is a complicated area yes. that requires some real expertise. Yes. So the, what I hear is basically you're saying you're, you're putting they're proposed out there for somebody to come in to help educate you on what to do. Right. What you need. I'll, I'll support and educate them. It, it'll, it'll collectively handle bits and pieces of the knowledge gap, but uh, mm -hmm. most of this is more of structuring the leases. Once those leases are structured, the information is in there, uh, ensuring that the city is 
negotiating the proper rate as well as marketing services, a lot of that can actually be handled in time. I feel like it's important just to use some context here, but Mr. Federman joined the Department of Emergency Communications from our budget office. He does bring out some significant expertise and some rights that I think adding in some additional consulting will, will complement uh, him to developing these, this sort of process and oversight going forward. Okay, does anyone have any follow-up questions on this? Comments? Would that be helpful to hear about it again? When do you expect the RFP to actually get speed on? RFP is on the street. It should be responses are due by the end of this month. Um, and then the whole process, I understand, was procurement. Uh, three to six months post that. So more towards the end of the year. Sabrina, do you want to amend that more than that? that? This time of year we'll from now, we'll, we'll see what happens. But this time of year from now, we all get the results on the end in terms of what you're, what you're able to do. Right? Be cool. Just put it on the agenda for March of 2024. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair, I, I would like to say briefly, I neglected to do so, and I presume the audit status continues to work hard to be productive. You know, some audits take longer than others, um, as, as the DPU audit did, but uh, we appreciate your support. We appreciate council's support. And uh, at the June meeting, we will have um, a new audit plan to present to you. I'm currently meeting with all nine of my bosses and trying to talk to them about that and solicit feedback as well as met with, with with Lincoln the other day and we'll throw that all into the risk process and um, try to uh, get a good audit plan for your approval at the June meeting. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to say that uh, over the years I've served on this committee, my confidence in uh, the management, both from the council level to the city management to the audit folks, is just increasing. Every, every step of the way. And it doesn't minimize the challenge that lies ahead, but my confidence is stronger all the time. So I just want to say thank you to all of you working so hard. We well, just said that with the reporters here. One of the things that, that, that you dealt with it, it's homes. It's not just, you know, it's more than just numbers, more than just balance sheet. You're talking about the impact of people's lives. So, one, I've always heard about this committee, and so it's great to put the name with the, with the face. But and now you're a member. Now I'm a member. <laughs> but, but, but seriously, thank y'all for the work that y'all do because it definitely matters. And it's our, I think we've got a, a great team between our IG and our auditor. I know because I definitely was in, I was in, definitely in, <laughs> involved in getting them in here and on board, so, but appreciate them. But then, I mean, I, I do see the difference on, on the administration side. I, I do. I mean, I've had a chance to sit down um, and spend a lot of time with Ms. Joy Hall, the thing that she's doing, um, and some of the same questions. It's going to take us how long to do something. Um, and so I appreciate everything, Sheila, everything that it will bring to the table, and even, even you know, He's not new anymore. He's not the new guy anymore. But, um, even everything that Lincoln has done, uh, trying to bring change, I see his leadership style and how he's relying on those that support him to do their work. I think that's a part of his success. So, uh, so I appreciate everything that y'all do. And then my colleagues who serve longer than I have uh, on this particular uh, committee. Sure well and just thank her as well. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Uh, I assume there's no new business. If there is, please speak up. If not, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm sorry the timer was off. Thank you.